Hello and welcome to The Analyst by Vajina Mandavi. Today is 11th of April and we would try to comprehensively address some of the very important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. The first article relates to a very progressive idea of womenomics. The second article is related to the need and importance of the One Health approach. The third article relates to what is probity in governance and what are the ways through which we can enhance the probity in governance. The fourth article is related to the threats which are posed because of the invasive alien species and the ways to mitigate them. The fifth article is related to a new online platform that is CDP Suraksha for the horticultural products in India. Finally, we would discuss some of the very important articles related to the preliminary exam. So the first article is related to a very interesting column related to womenomics. So what we see is that Japan through its various reform measures has significantly improved the women labor force participation rate. Now it becomes really important for India to actually learn from the whole process and try to incorporate those reform measures. So this concerns with GS1 role of women and associated issues. Then GS2 issues relating to the development and management of social sector. Then GS3 inclusive growth. So let's start. Now, what is actually Japan's womenomics? So these are nothing but a series of reform measures, right? Which were actually led by the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2014, right? And these reform measures were, were actually done even when Japan was grappling with serious issues. For example, falling fertility rates. Then you have the declining population, right? A stagnant growth. growth. So despite having all these issues, Japan actually initiated a series of reform measures and that resulted into the increase in the women labor force participation rate. So if we see that the women labor force participation rate in Japan that has actually grown by 10 points from 2013 till 2023, that is from 64.9% to 75.2% that is 64.9% in 2013 to 75.2% in 2023 right now this is not just the fastest growth in Japan's women labor force participation rate in the past few decades but it is also the highest among the G7 countries right now coming to the next part that is this achievement that this increase in the women labor force particip participation rate that has been primarily in the age group of 30 to 34 years and 35 to 39 years. What it implies is that there has been a return of mothers to the workforce. Next is that Japan has actually added, Japan has roughly added around 3 million women to its workforce. And this has increased Japan's per capita by around 4 to 8%. Right. So these are all achievements which happened due to a series of reform measures, right? Now, majority of these womenomics reforms, they were actually focused on two aspects. The first is the investments in care economy. And the second is the rebalancing of gender norms. So investing in the care eco economy and the rebalancing of the gender norms. These were the primarily two aspects which actually led to the increase in the women labor force participation rate. Now, if we talk about the steps taken by Japan, we would see that the Japanese government has significantly invested into the expansion of daycare capacity and it has actually increased from 2.2 million in 2012 to 2.8 million in 2018. Now, this has actually reduced the daycare waiting list, which often, which would often run into years, right? Then in 2023, Japan actually announced an investment of $26 billion for the child care measures that is between 2023 and 2026, right? Then there were also provisions with respect to greater flexibility in the paternity leave provisions, right? Also, there were other reform measures, for example, reducing the notice period, right? Allowing men to actually break their paternity leave, introducing flexible work hours, so these were the reform measures, right? Now, moreover, companies were actually encouraged to demonstrate that taking paternity leave would not hamper their career progressions, right? Because 
what happens is that this paternity leave, the concept of paternity leave, it is sort of a stereotype. And when companies themselves an encourage paternity leave, it leads to the acceptance of this concept, right? And it has actually result resulted into boosting the paternity leave uptake. That is, it was 2% in 2012 and it increased to around 17% in 2023, right? So that is a significant improvement. Now, if we talk about next aspect, in 2016, Japan actually incorporated, enacted a law which says that the name of the law is Promotion of Women's Participation and Advancement in the Workplace, right? So this act actually helped into recognizing that companies need to focus upon diversity, that is workforce diversity. So this law led to the strengthening of the provision that companies have to accept this notion of workforce diversity. And this also ultimately led to the creation of, introduction of Euroboshi certification. Now, this is a five-star system which actually focuses upon recognizing the companies which actually focus upon the workforce diversity, right? So, the more a company gives importance to the workforce diversity, the more star rating it has. Now, this has actually, this certification has become quite aspirational among the Japanese firms today. And the number of firms has significantly improved. That is from 815 in 2019 to 1905, 1905 in 2022, right? So there's a significant improvement, right? Now we can also see from the graph that the Japanese labor, female labor force participation rate that has actually surpassed that of the US, right? And that's, this is a data from 2016, right? Now what actually can India learn from Japan? See, Japan and India, they share sort of cultural similarities. And this similarity, it also stands out to one of the most uh, defining parameters that is the social norms surrounding the domestic work we need to keep in mind that among the g20 countries india and japan have the widest gender gaps of unpaid care in the unpaid care that is for india it is around 8.4 times right and it constitutes around 15 to 17 percent of the country's gdp while for japan this number is 5.5 times Right. So the gender gaps in the unpaid care work, it is 8.4 times for India and this constitutes around 15 to 17 percent of the GDP. And for Japan, this is 5.5 times and this constitute around one fifth of Japan's GDP. Right. So that is a point of concern. Now, what lessons can actually India take from Japan's experience as India? is embarking on a sort of women-led development. So we need to incorporate those strategies which have actually got fruits for uh, Japan, right? The first is that interventions which have been there in Japan, they have for bridging the gender gaps in the domestic and care work, they have got significant impact on women labor force participation rate, right? So Japan actually saw the highest gains in the women labor force participation rate when it actually intervened to bridge the gender gaps and it's when it's when it started to invest in the domestic and the care work right second is that changing people's mindset around social norms is as important as formulating progressive regulations what we mean is that the legal entitlements they are not sufficient right so what we need is that there has to be a sort of a mindset change for example the uh, concept of having sort of a stereotype when it comes to the pat uh, paternity leave, right? So that has to be changed and it has to come from the employer side, right? So enhancing the uptake, enhancing the uptake among men requires an employer led approach, right? So that these stereotypes, they can be dispelled, right? Now, it is also third, it is essential to invest in a wide range of care infrastructure and services solutions, right? Which not only focus on the children, but also focus upon the elderly care, right? So that is important. We need to understand that we need to reduce the dependency and we need to have sort of an access to the silver economy. That is one of the most important criteria. For example, we can have sort of private sector partnerships when it comes to affordable housing for seniors, like living in uh, uh, different areas, and we can have care services through the PPP mode, right? Also, it needs to be uh, kept in mind that the as the share of elderly population in uh, India is increasing, that is, it is said that according to the data, that it is set to increase from 10% as of now to 20% by 2050. Right. So that is a significant uh, increase in the number of elderly population. So we actually also need to prioritize elderly care through actually giving incentives 
for infrastructure creations that is infrastructure for the elderly care right and the elderly economy that is a silver economy what we talk about right so the policy focus should be first gender neutral and paternity leave policies then actually enhancing investments in the care institution infrastructure and services then skill training for the care workers and then quality assurance for the care services and infrastructure this what we see is that after nearly declining for five decades the female labor force participation after nearly declining for five decades it has seen a sort of significant uh, uh, increase in the trajectory right that is it has increased from around 23 percent in 2017 to around 37 percent in 2022 right so what uh, in order to keep this momentum going what we need to focus upon is continuous focus on such intervention that is investing in the care economy, dispelling the stereotypes around the paternity leave, right? Having more incentives for the women to join the labor force, right? So all these comprehensive holistic measures are required so that India can also reap the benefit of having more women into the workforce. Coming to the second article, we have the concept of One Health, right? So this is becoming uh, very important, especially after the uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So recently, the National One Health mission has been approved by the cabinet, and it remains to be seen how the government actually adopts this policy of One Health into its overall policy framework, right? Now, this concerns with the GS2 health and social sector. Now, what is the concept of One Health? So it is basically an integrated unifying approach to balance and optimize the health of people, animals and the environment. So what we see is it is a sort of a comprehensive approach which tries to include within its parameters the human health, the environmental health and the animal health. Right. It also in particular focuses upon the prevention and prediction and detection and resp respond to the global health threats. Right. Particularly, for example, if we uh, witnessed the COVID-19 pandemic now the approach actually tries to mobilize different multiple sectors right disciplines and communities so what we see is that it is an interdisciplinary approach right and there are multiple stakeholders who are actually responsible for framing this one health approach right now this one health approach it actually involves the public health the veterinary and the environmental sectors now this approach is particularly relevant for food and water safety nutrition control of zoonosis that is the spread of disease between the animals and the humans right pollution management and combating the antimicrobial resistance that is the emergence of those microbes that are actually resistant to the antibiotic therapies right so that is the concept of amr now how is actually the world health organization advancing the one health approach see who has actually come up with uh, the one health initiative and this initiative it actually tries to integrate the work on human animal and environmental health right moreover un in partnership with other organizations for example we have the food and agriculture Org organization the united nations environment program then the world organization for animal health now they have come and formed a sort of one health quadripartite right so this quadripartite it actually focuses upon different aspects for example integrating multi-sectoral aspects and then coming out with policy suggestions right so that is one aspect next the one health the WHO has also formed the One Health High Level Expert Panel, right? So this actually advises the FAO, UNEP, WHO and the World Organization for Animal Health on research of emerging diseases, right? Then it also focuses upon the development of long term global plan to actually avert the diseases, for example, COVID-19 or we have got the Ebola, right? Or we have the Zika virus, right? So to avert these diseases, it has to come up, it has tried to come up with different strategies. So that is the work of the expert panel. So considering all these, the uh, government of India has come up with the national One Health mission, right? So it actually marks a sort of a milestone for the India's overall health policy structure, right? So we'll try to see what are the different aspect of uh, the national One Health policy, that is the One Health mission. So along the lines of this mission, there have there has been a proposal to actually uh, set up a, a, a national institute for One Health. Now this, the mandate of this institute would be to coordinate activities nationally, 
and internationally across the space of one health right then the goals of the mission national one health mission is to develop strategies and ensure seamless information sharing that is strategies for integrated disease surveillance right or outbreak outbreak measures or response right and to actually share the information with respect to better control of diseases or th these can be uh, uh, routine diseases or these can be sort of infectious diseases right so that is the case now while diseases that actually affect the humans they are quite well known right we as we just discussed the zika virus the ebola the covid 19 but those diseases that actually affect the animals they are also uh, a quarter, uh, a sort of a point of concern for example we have got the foot and mouth disease for example we have got, got the lumpy skin disease so these are serious issues serious health issues with respect to the animal health right and they actually ultimately result into hitting the productivity and trade right also we have got other diseases for example we have got the canine distemper so this actually affects the wild animals right so that is a cause of concern now what is the solution to this problem so what the solution is we need to have a sort of a coordinated approach right for example for a disease like nipah virus or any other disease we need to have a coordinated approach so that we are better prepared and we have got quick response measures right so that should be the ideal case now the focus of this mission is on the strong having strong research and development right so that we can ensure that we are better prepared right so there needs to be sort of also a collaborative approach we have got different and uh, departments right and different departments have their own laboratories so what is needed is that there should be a sort of a collaboration mechanism among all these departments for example we have got the department of biotechnology then we have got the council of scientific and industrial research then the indian council of medical research then the indian council of agriculture research then we have got the department of pharmaceuticals right along with them we also need the involvement of the private sector we already saw that during the covid crisis it was the private sector the uh, the institutes the serum institute for example which actually came forward and started investing a lot of money into the research and development for the development of vaccines so their inclusion in this whole process also becomes important now ultimately we need to see that states are the ones who implement the schemes on the ground so the incorporation of state governments through the research and development through proper funding is also necessary right so that is the key aspect then under this mission there has been a proposal to set up a network of high risk pathogen laboratories that is which has the biosafety level 3 or 4 right that has been actually proposed so bringing such laboratories together this this was this would actually which are under the different departments this would provide quick response and better utilization of resources that is optimization of resources right so that is needed then we have got a very important point that is focus on the augmentation of epidemiology and data analytic capabilities what is epidemiology it is the study of the how the disease actually spreads the patterns of the disease that is the epidemiology so what we need to do is we need to incorporate the recent uh, technological advancements for example in the data analytics for example we have got the artificial intelligence or machine learning and disease modeling and then we have got emerging approaches for example the genomic studies right so as it showed a, a, a quite promising uh, effect when it comes to the covid 19 so all these things should be incorporated in enhancing the overall framework of the one health right now we need to also keep in mind that the one health approach is a global topic right during the india's presidency of the g20 right this approach was highlighted and all the members actually endorsed the idea of building better surveillance capacity right better analytic capacity right they also agreed on the fact that we need to install we need to have sort of one health institutes around the world right so that is a good a silver lining right so what we need to understand that one health is the approach of one health is not just restricted to the diseases right it concerns wider aspects that is it includes antimicrobial resistance food safety plant disease and the impact of climate change so all these 
factors are included in this concept of one health right so it requires a close engagement of different stakeholders and then finally we can uh, come to this uh, approach of one health and have focus on this aspect of disease prevention right and ultimately achieve the objective of having the health for all health for all right so that should be the objective right now the next article is about the probity in governance so what has recently happened is that uh, three uh, senior IS officers it has this incident has not happened now it happened way back in 2015 but the report uh, the audit report has recently revealed that three senior uh, IS officers they actually had this unauthorized expenditure they went to foreign trip and they utilized the public funds now this actually brings to the fore the importance of having probity in governance now this is a very important aspect uh, if it comes to the gs4 probity in governance and utilization of public funds so we'll understand what probity means and we'll understand ways to enhance the probity now what is probity in governance see probity it essentially refers to the principles of honesty integrity and ethical conduct which is actually expected out of the public officials right so it is essentially about creating a sort of a trustworthy system and a fair government system that is what we mean by the probity now it actually entails some of the very important features the first is the core value right if you talk about the core value probity emphasizes on some core values in as ethics in public administration for example we have got the values of honesty we have got accountability we have got fairness we have got transparency but probity has somewhat a more focus upon preventing corruption right and actually preventing the misuse of power that is the objective that is a, a main crux of probity right then we have got the aspect of following the rules what it means is that probity means upholding probity it actually means adhering to the established laws regulations and procedures so that it actually for ensures fair and predictable decision making right and it reduces the aspect the uh, the chances of manipulation or favoritism right manipulation or favoritism those uh, chances are reduced that is one aspect then the next aspect is of openness and transparency what we mean is that the public officials practicing probity they should be transparent in their actions and decisions this actually includes disclosing the potential conflict of interest right and making relevant information available in the public domain that is one aspect then officials must be held accountable for their decisions and actions for example we have got the mechanisms like performance review like or or we have got uh, public scrutiny like so these are the mechanisms mechanisms through which we can ensure the accountability of their actions then we have got strengthening the public trust so probity in governance it aims to build public trust in the government institutions that is what it means is that is a commitment to ethical conduct right and having sort of fair practices that is the one aspect now when we talk about probity when we talk about the behavior which is expected out of a public official there is one very important aspect in ethics and that is the nolan principles so in 1994 the united kingdom it actually uh, the government of the united kingdom it constituted a committee under the chairmanship of lord nolan to actually recommend the standards which a public official is expected to have in the public life right so uh, it gave the first report uh, gave a series of recommendations and in that report we had this seven principles right so they outlined what uh, the uh, core values of public officials should be now this becomes very important when it comes to the ethics so let's have a discussion about that them so they are actually uh, widely recognized as a benchmark for ethical conduct around the globe right so that's the reason it becomes very important now if we talk about the first uh, principle that is the selflessness what it means is that the public official they should not put their own interest first they should put put the interest of public first and then their own personal interest then the aspect of integrity what it means is that they should avoid having conflict of interest that is one aspect and they should actually act with honesty right there should be complete integrity then next is objectivity what it means is that they should actually avoid prejudice or bias when they uh, take any action that is one aspect next is we have got accountability so what it means is that they should be open to scrutiny 
right and they should be willing to explain what actions they have actually taken right that is the aspect of accountability then we have got the uh, concept of openness that is having making the relevant information open in in the public right they should not hide any information right that is the aspect next we have got honesty so what is expected out of a public servant is that that they need need to be honest in their public dealings that is one aspect finally we have got the concept of leadership and this becomes the most important they have to set up positive examples for other right they have to showcase that leadership skill and only then you know and this is actually a result of summation of all the values so the the leadership comes when they actually imbibe all these values and set example for others right so that is the aspect now let's talk about how we can actually enhance probity uh, in governance in india right so there are different steps right first is that we need to strengthen the legal framework and enforcement so if we go by the data we have got the corruption perception index right so according to the corruption per perception index which is actually released by transparency international this information can be important for your prelims right so uh, india actually ranked 93 out of 180 countries that is the first aspect when it comes to the data now the first step is effectively implementing the existing anti corruption laws india has a lot of uh, very strong anti corruption laws for example we have got the prevention of corruption act 2002 but when it comes to the implementation we lack uh, on this part so we need to have sort of very strong laws and very strong legal framework and a proper implementation of those laws then we have got strengthening different institutions for example we have got the central vigilance commission right so we need to strengthen these in institutions for strict oversight there has to be strict oversight then we need to enact strong public interest disclosure framework and also have safeguards for the whistle blower so that there can be encouragement given to reporting of corruption right there are people who actually uh, they know that something uh, miss that, that something uh, bad is actually happening in the department but they are uh, actually afraid to uh, come into the public so there needs to be sort of an effective mechanism for these people so that they can raise their voice they can bring to the fore what is actually happening in a particular department right then comes the promoting the transparency and accountability so a 2019 survey by the prs legislative research it said that only 42% of the citizens they were satisfied with the transparency which the government has right so that is a very less number right that perception is very less so what we need is we need to actually implement different measures for example we need to implement the rti more effectively so that the citizens can have access to more information of about the public functioning then we need to, we need to use the e governance initiatives so as to increase the transparency and decision making right then we need to strengthen the social audits so as to involve the citizen in monitoring the government spending right so they also become uh, an equal stakeholder right so next we have the ethical conduct and the codes of conduct so a study uh, of 2020 by kanji india it actually uh, said that majority of indians feel that the political parties are corrupt right uh, so what we need is we need to have sort of strong codes of conduct for all public officials so that it outlines what behavior they are expected in the public domain right what kind of behavior they should they should uh, showcase then we have got providing ethics training to all the officers at in the in the hierarchy right at regular interval of times that should be the case then we have got encouraging political parties to have sort of an internal mechanisms so that they can also imbibe uh, they can also infuse that ethical conduct among its members now talking about the next next aspect we have got utilizing technology and innovations so a 2021 report by the world bank it actually talked about that technology has a huge potential in increasing the transparency right so uh, technology needs to be accepted for example we need to leverage technology for online applications or grievance redressal right we need to go for cashless transactions so that the opportunity for corruption is reduced right then investing in data analytics we need to invest in data analytics so that we can find the patterns of corruption and we can target we can have specific target targeted mechanisms right to identify the zones or the, uh, the or the departments which are more prone to corruption and take suitable measures right then what is needed is that we need to have sort of 
public awareness and participation. So, a 2017 survey by Transparency International, it actually uh, found that, that ordinary citizens can play a huge role when it comes to the fight against corruption, right? So, the ordinary citizens have a huge role to play. Now, what uh, is needed is that we need to support the civil society organizations. For example, we have got different organizations working in India against corruption. We have got the Association of Democratic Reforms. Then we have got People's Union for Civil Liberties. So we need to support these organizations, right? Then we need to encourage citizen participation. That is in public hearings or sort of having grievance redressal mechanisms. So that is needed, right? So what we see is that if we adopt these multi-pronged approach, for example, having strengthening legal framework or promoting transparency and accountability or utilizing technology, what we can have is we can have a more robust framework for probity and governance. And ultimately, we need to understand that this is an ongoing process, right? We need to continuously monitor and then make policies accordingly. Right. And only then we can ensure that we have got probity in governance and we have got a corruption free society. So the next article is about the concept of invasive alien species. So recently uh, we have seen that uh, the Cheetal population in the Andamans that has been uh, causing a sort of a concern in the Andamans and uh, we'll see what invasive species are, what are the concerns and why we need to have sort of those strategies through which we, we can mitigate these concerns, right? So it concerns with GS3 environment portion. So what are invasive alien species? So according to the Convention on Biological Diversity, right? These invasive alien species, these are those species whose introduction or spread outside their natural past or present distribution threatens the biological diversity. The same convention also gives few characteristics of these invasive alien species. It says they arrive, they survive and thrive. What we mean is that these species, they actually need an introduction, either naturally or through human intervention, right? And then they survive, right? On the native food resources. What happens next is that then they rep reproduce at a very fast rate. And then a situation comes when they edge out the native species. So that is the whole process, right? That is arrive, survive and thrive. Now, if we talk about what the definition of the uh, invasive alien species is, the legal definition in India. So that is actually given in the Wildlife Protection Act. But that definition is narrow. It's a narrow defi definition because the same Cheetal in Andaman, which is causing, which is sort of uh, an invasive alien species over there, is a protected species when it comes to the mainland, right? And the Wildlife Act doesn't re uh, recognize that. So that becomes a point of concern, right? So what is needed is that we also need to focus upon having a sort of robust uh, legal framework so that we can define the invasive alien species in accordance to the specific geographical location, right? That is needed. Now, what are the some of the examples? of invasive species. So the list of invasive uh, alien species in India is dominated by certain spe species of fish. For example, we have got the African catfish. We will also talk about it. Then we have got Nile tilapia. Then we have got turtle species. For example, the red eared slider, right? Now, how do the these invasive alien species impact the natural flora and fauna, right? So these species, they actually act as disruptors in the food chain and disturb the balance of the ecosystem. That is what it leads to is that in those habitats, right, where there is no competition, these species can actually dominate the entire ecosystem, right? So uh, if there is no competition, they can dominate the entire ecosystem. That becomes a point of concern. Next, for example, we have got the African catfish. So this has become a menace in Keoladio National Park, right? So over there, this actually has a prey. This catfish preys on the, even the migratory birds. So those migratory birds which fly for thousands of kilometers and then come to the Keoladio uh, National Park, they uh, then these fish, the African catfish, they actually feed on them, right? So that becomes a point of concern. So these invasive uh, alien species, they are a threat on the flora and the fauna of the respective geographical areas. Now, if you talk about the economic impacts of these alien species, invasive alien species, we see that the U United Nations uh, formed body, that is the International Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, it has come out with an exhaustive report in September 2023. And it says that, Almost 37,000 
species of invasive alien species they have been introduced in the worldwide and almost 200 are added every year right so this is a point of concern now the global economic costs of the invasive alien species it is estimated to be around uh, 423 billion dollars annually and this was estimated in the year 2019 right so obviously this number is also huge right so and this is a cost which arise due to the damage which invasive alien species have on the natural area so the damage caused by them leads to this economic cost now also we have got the national biodiversity action plan by the national biodiversity authority now this says that it published in a report and it said that the cotton mealybug which is an uh, invasive alien species which is native to North America. Now this has caused a lot of economic losses for the cotton growers right, in the Deccan area. So this has also led to eel losses. right. So that is, has been published in the report itself. Now what should be the strategies to have sort of mitigate, uh, mitigation strategies? in order to deal with these invasive alien species. The first is the prevention. So there was a study which was published in the research gate and it noted that India lacks a sort of a legislative framework when it comes to uh, dealing with the uh, invasive alien species. So what we need to focus upon is the first aspect is strengthening the border biosecurity. For example, having strict quarantine measures. That is the first aspect. Then what we need to have is a sort of public awareness campaigns. That is, we need to educate people about the risks involved in uh, having invasive alien species. For example, there is a sort of a prevalence of pet trade, right? So we need to inform the people that these species can be invasive and cause damage to the natural environment. Then we have got, we need to conduct risk assessments so that we can identify the potential invasive alien species before they actually uh, become established in the whole ecosystem right then we need to have early detection and rapid response systems so the down to earth report it actually said that that indian laws are actually inadequate for monitoring and controlling the population of invasive alien species the established invalian, uh, invasive alien species so what we need to focus upon is that we need to have strict implementation of early detection uh, systems that is to identify the new infestations right and then take quicker actions then we need to develop rapid response plans what do we mean by is that we need to control or let's say eradicate the infestations before they become widespread so be before they come uh, and cross the whole area what we need to have is sort of an eradication mechanism that is needed so then we have the control and eradication mechanism so a study published by the indian council for forest uh, research and education it actually talked about that there is a lack of information on the number and the impact of uh, invasive species in India. There is, the, there is lack of repository of information available. So what we need to have is implementing control measures. Now those control measures can be mechanical, for example, uh, cutting directly through a cutters or having sort of biological or chemical methods so that we can have targeted applications, right? Targeted removal, right, of that particular species. Then we need to have got strong research in these areas so that we need to we can develop new methods for effective control of these invasive alien species then we need to focus upon the restoration and rehabilitation so a study by uh, mogabe india in 2023 it said that these invasive alien species they have even spread to areas such as himalayan himalayan region right so a strong uh, there's a strong reason for the restoration of the native species so what we need to uh, focus upon is developing restoration plans which actually focus upon recovering the ecosystems which are damaged because of invasive alien species right then reintroducing the native plant species which have been displaced by these invasive alien species right then we have the aspect of public participation and capacity building what is needed is that we need to engage the local communities in the invasive alien species management for example providing them with adequate knowledge with adequate financial incentives that is needed then raising public awareness is needed right so that we can have proper informed decisions about the threats 
phased. So what we uh, mean to say is that by adopting a combination of all these strategies, we can effectively tackle the challenge of the invasive alien species. So and what it also requires is a multi-sectoral collaborative efforts that is from the government, from the research institutes, from the private participants, from the community, right? Only then we can mitigate this threat of invasive alien species. So the next article is related to the CDP Suraksha. So it is an online platform which the government has recently come up with and it relates to the horticultural crops, right? So we'll talk about the importance of horticulture and the different aspect of this CDP Suraksha, right? So it concerns with GS3, agriculture and technology. Now, if we talk about horticulture, what is horticulture? See, horticulture is a study or practice of growing flowers, fruits and vegetables. That is what we mean by horticulture. Now, this is very important. It contributes a lot to the Indian economy and it constitutes one third. It contributes one third to the agricultural gross value added, right? Next, it also, the, the production has also spiked in recent years. That is from 2010-11 when the quantity of the horticultural production in India was 240.5 million tons. It has increased to around 334 million tons, right? So there has been a sort of a great improvement in the amount of horticulture products in India, right? And it also contributes significantly to Indian economy. It has been estimated that the horticulture actually contributes around 8.8% to the Indian economy. That is the reason the government has come up with various interventions, various schemes. For example, we have got the MIDH, that is Mission on Integrated Development of Horticulture. Then we have got the National Horticultural Mission. Then we have got the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sachai Yojana, the irrigation part, the micro irrigation part. So these are the government interventions which have come in the horticulture area. Now talking about what is the CDP Suraksha. See, understand, this is essentially, essentially a digital platform where Suraksha actually means system for unified resource allocation knowledge and secure horticultural assistance right so system for uniform resource allocation knowledge and secure horticultural assistance so that is an online platform and the suraksha means this now it actually allows the instant dispersal of subsidies right to the farmers in their bank account right and it utilizes the e rupee voucher that is from the NPCI. We'll talk about it, what e, uh, e rupee is all about. And it has different features of database integration. For example, it has integration with PM, Kisan. It has integration with the cloud-based service of NIC. Then it has got integration with UIDI. Then it has e rupee integration. Then it has also uh, the content management system. It also has geotagging, right? Geofencing, right? So all these systems are actually integrated along with this uh, in CDP Suraksha, right? Now, how does this actually works, right? What are the steps involved? We'll try to see in steps how the process takes place. So what happens is that this platform actually allows access to different stakeholders. Who can be the different stakeholders? The first is the farmer, right? Then we have got vendor. Then we have got the implementing agen agencies. Then we have got the cluster development agencies, CDAs, right? Then we have got the officials from the National Horticulture Board. So these are the different stakeholders. So this actually provides access to different stakeholders, right? So a farmer can actually log in using his uh, mobile number and place an order for planting material that that can be seeds or uh, for example, saplings, right? based on the requirement uh, he or she has. Now, after the demand has been raised by the farmer, the system would actually ask the, to contribute their share of cost, right? And then the subsidy amount would be paid by the government and it would uh, appear on the screen automatically. Now, after the farmer pays the contribution, an e rupee voucher would be generated. That is for the vendor who is actually supplying this planting material, maybe the seeds or the saplings, right? Now, once the planting material is delivered to the farmer, that is once it is delivered, the farmer will have to verify the delivery through taking photos or videos and uploading it on the uh, platform, right? Then after the verification of the implementing agency, then it it will release the money to the vendor, right? After the implementing agency receives, sees that, yes, uh, the, 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 the material has been transferred, only then it will release the uh, money to the vendor and for the e-rupee voucher, 
Now, after the vendor receives the money, that vendor will have to upload that receipt on the same platform and then the implementing agency will collect and share all the documents to the cluster development agency and then the cluster development agency would release the subsidy for the implementing agency. So that is a whole series of steps which are involved in this process. Now let's talk about what is eRupee. See this mechanism, this platform, online platform of CDP Suraksha, it actually utilizes this eRupee, right? And eRupee voucher. Now eRupee voucher is a one-time payment mechanism. It's a one-time payment mechanism developed by National Payment Corporation of India. Now this can be redeemed without the need of having sort of a card or a digital payment app or internet banking service. That is not needed in this case, right? So add the merchants who are actually accepting the e-rupee. Now e-rupee can be shared with beneficiaries for a specific purpose, right? That is by the government or any organization in the form of an SMS, or a QR code, right? So that is what the concept of e-rupee is all about. Now, how is this new system different from the old one? See, in the old system, the farmer had to buy the planting materials on their own, right? And then they had to go to the uh, to the officials for the release of subsidy. Now, this was a sort of a very cumbersome process. So now we have got a whole series of steps and a whole integrated process through which the farmer actually will take the subsidies, will get the benefits of the subsidies at the upfront, that at the time of buying the uh, planting material itself and the vendors will receive money their payment only after the farmers have verified the delivery of their orders that is the orders of the planting material right so the whole system is very different from the earlier one and it promotes transparency now what is the cluster development program right so the cluster development program is actually a component of the central sector scheme of national horticultural board that is the first aspect it is aimed at leveraging the geographical specialization of horticultural clusters that is you have got specific uh, geographical areas which are famous which are actually known for specific uh, horticultural products right so it focuses on creating that cluster approach then it also promotes an integrated and market-led development of the whole chain the whole supply chain that is from pre-production to the production then to the marketing right so it uh, has a sort of a whole mechanism for the whole supply chain so the government um, has actually identified almost 55 uh, horticulture clusters and out of these 12 are at the pilot stage and these are at different stages of development and each cluster would have its own implementing agency and cluster development agency so about 9 lakh hectares of area has been covered through this and the government actually aims to cover around 10 lakh farmers right thus what we see is that uh, this horticulture products they have focus upon the high value crops and these high value crops uh, they act as a significant incentive for the farmers to enhance their incomes right and this actually leads to the overall development of the agriculture so through these interventions for example with the cdp suraksha or the midh or the national horticulture mission we we hope that the horticulture sector will definitely witness a boom and it will contribute to the overall agriculture sector in india so coming to the prelim snippet sections, we will be talking about the National Green Tri Tribunal, then we will talk about the National Infrastructure and Investment Fund, then we will talk about the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960, and then we will talk about the recently released QS ranking. So let's start. So coming to the National Green Tribunal. So it is a statutory body and it is set up under the National Greens Tribunal Act and it is set up for the effective and expeditious disposal of cases relating to the environment protection and also conservation of forests and other natural resources right now this is a specialized body and equipped with the necessary expertise to handle the environmental concerns right now it is not bound by the code of civil procedure and it is guided by the principles of natural justice right that is one of the aspect then it consists of the chairperson who should be a retired judge of the supreme court then you have got judicial members who should be retired as the judges of high court then you have got expert members who have got domain expertise with respect to the environment now the schedule one of the ngt has some laws listed so over that the ngt can pass a specific ruling right so through the schedule one the listed laws the NGT can pass the any ruling with respect to any of the laws mentioned in the Schedule 1. Now, the NGT order can be reviewed as per the NGT rules, right? And if the order 
is not uh, if the review has not been made the order can also be challenged before the supreme court if the if, if the review petition actually fails right so that is all about the ngt then we have got the national investment and infrastructure fund now this is a government owned company and it maintains the infrastructure investment funds for both the domestic inve investors as well as the in international investors and this fund is anchored by the government of india so the objective is to capitalize capital in the country and to support its growth across different sectors of importance now this was first announced in the union budget of 2015-16 as an alternate investment fund right with a corpus of around 20000 crores which which actually uh, came from the government side right now they the government actually committed to keeping its share of around 49% in this uh, uh, national niif fund right now the niif actually manages three types of funds the first is the master fund right the second is the funds of fund and the strategic fund so the master fund the objective of the master fund is actually it primarily invests in operating assets for example you have got the roads or ports or airports or power that is the objective then you have got the funds of funds now this actually provides funds to the promising fund managers who have a good track record so that they can further invest in different areas for example we have got affordable housing then we have got green investments right or social infrastructure right so that is the aspect then we have got the strategic fund now this strategic fund actually focuses upon investing in those funds which actually offer long term growth right to the strategic sectors in the economy that is the strategic fund right next we have got the prevention of cruelty to animals act now this act aims to prevent the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering on the animals so as per the law in 1962 the government actually formed the animal welfare board of india right now the stewardship of this uh, organization was actually led by the acclaimed dancer rukmani devi arundale right now the chapter 3 of this uh, act it lists multiple different forms of cruelty that are banned by the act right then the chapter 5 outlines the restrictions or procedures and the registrations or offenses related to or exemptions for performing animals right then chapter 5 makes a provision under the heading saving as respects manner of killing prescribed by religion so if you have got uh, the religion which actually prescribes it so it is an exception under the law right then we have got a very important article which tells about the status of higher education institutions in india that is by the qs ranking so we need to understand what uh, the what this organization is all about so it's a london based higher education analytics firm so the report has come to the conclusion that the am amdabad is among the top 25 institutions globally for business and marriage management studies next the iims in bangalore and calcutta are among the top 50 now the jnu is the highest ranked university in india then you have got at the savita institute of medical and technical services is at the 24th position when it comes to the dentistry studies then regionally india has a second spot in terms of the number of universities featured that is 69 trailing just behind that of china and it has featured 101 universities india ranks fifth regionally for the number of top 200 entries one of the biggest challenges providing high quality tertiary education has been uh, pointed out uh, in this report because the national education policy has a goal of actually having 50% gross enrollment ratio by the year 2035 when it comes to the higher education so that's all for today thank you